This is the balance wheel and crank handle on the original Zipraxis scope and with some research online I discovered it's probably the 1879 Singer which is interesting because 79 was the year Mybridge probably built the Zipraxis scope which we can see uh, matches. I couldn't find an exact one but this is an 1890s Singer wheel that I did manage to acquire. This is the um, acrylic discs I've ordered recently. There are two here together with a blue protective wrapping and hoping that they're going to be the right size. There is a very small hole drilled in the centre which I can use to enlarge with, um, with a special hole driller thing that I've got and see if we can turn that into a disc sandwich with a thin picture layer of acetate in the middle. Well, I found a handle that fits the uh, hole borer. I've never actually bored a hole with one of these before. We'll see. Well, there's, there's swarf coming off, so and the hole's getting bigger. It seems to be reasonably regular, so oh, wish me luck. So I finished cutting those centre holes. I had a TIFF file printed out onto A3 acetate, flexible acetate. I have tried it and it works but it just needs slightly, slightly realigning and then I'll close up the two acetate discs to make an elephant sandwich and we'll try it again. I've got some mild steel pipe now which is with a little bit of packing underneath so I'm going to have to look at that because it's obviously not right, but it goes, we'll go to somewhere like here, maybe. Let's have a look. That's actually quite a nice fit. There's a slight wobble on there, but we can deal with that. Uh, and then obviously there'll be a handle that turns out wheel. I'm working on the handle. And I've decided, I did have them, um, I've actually got two of these collars. And I was going to have one here, that side of the wheel and one the other side of the wheel and then push them together with a little bit of um, abrasive material to, to, to hold that wheel steady on the shaft but um, I think what I'm actually going to do, it, it, it takes it out to, to there which I don't really want. so I think what I'm actually going to do is just make a washer to go in there and then just have the collar on this side and the reason that I'm not sliding it on there at the moment is <clears throat> it doesn't fit it should do but I've got to take down the tube a little at this end to get the collar on it's almost it almost it's just a tiny fraction away so it will go on there uh, and then with that collar on there and the handle we should be in business now the next question is can I cut this with a hacksaw don't know. Hacksaws at the ready. I'll find out and let you know. And if not, we're going to have to make a trip to Bexhill to the engineering company there and ask them to chop that for me. And the answer was yes, I did manage to cut it with a hacksaw. That's my end. Which obviously needs tidying up, as does the other end, which was from the supplier. That's pretty untidy too. So I'll just uh, sort that out. It's going to go something like that then the washer and that and then the collar when that fits and I think that's going to be pretty good lots of fiddling about to do now though well it's starting to go on there 
so it shouldn't be too much trouble to make that work. Got to slip back a little more, yeah. The single sewing machine handle's now been fitted. I still have to put that cap on there. I'll glue that just to finish that off with a small disc covering the aperture. Um, but essentially it's on there and there's a handle on there with the help of some Meccano pieces that I've blacked over. So it's a technician's work around, it's not an engineering job and I've had to put some uh, shims under the uh, sewing machine handle but it works. It's a little bit wobbly because it's just it's simply glued with some contact adhesive to the shaft so it can be easily pulled off for a proper engineering job at some point um, but as you can see it's fine for the initial purposes and it just looks so much better than trying to fit a handle to the old uh, pulley system that was on there so it does look more authentic it's not exactly the same as the one that's on the original but it's close enough and it, it is the right size now with regard to the shutter and also this aperture plate arrangement and the fingerprints which I've not cleaned off particularly well because that would just leave to lead to further deterioration later um, so the thing is in the original all of the shutter and these pieces were painted black so they were protected uh, in the replica they haven't been and that would have been fine if this brass had been lacquered but it wasn't so inevitably it will pick up fingerprints that will eat into the brass to some extent and I'm not going to deal with that at some point I would recommend that this goes to an engineering firm maybe local to Kingston if one can be found for this to be fitted on more professionally and for the shutter and aspect ratio plate system to be painted black as per the original don't know why they didn't do it but um, there we are there is a slight problem with these shutters it's the same with both machines but I'll just give an indication from this one you can see here that at this particular adjustment there's a very wide slot and the other side of the shutter that can be adjusted up and down is very low in the next slot the next slot the slots narrower and the adjustment piece is much higher here it's about halfway a bit less than halfway so they're all pretty good pretty consistent that one slots wider it's nowhere near coming halfway same with that so you can see that the slot widths are not all the same what that means is that you're not only getting a different level of light through for each image but you're also seeing the image for fractionally longer which means that the focus of that particular image out of the 13 that we're using is going to be less this could be improved by sticking some black paper halfway across on the wider slots so all the slots could be made to be the same and generally narrower at the moment because they all are adjusted with um, a single control it's only possible to adjust them to a certain extent if I close up the slots more then the very narrow slots will actually close and you won't see that image on the screen so yeah it's just the tolerances of, of this were not as good as that of the original understandably it's not an easy thing to do the effect on the screen you won't really know to what extent it would have any effect unless you you made a comparison and you did it and then found out whether there was any noticeable effect this lever that operates the um, aspect ratio plate mechanism 
the shape of the picture basically. There was nothing to stop it raising too high and then the whole mechanism fell apart. In this photograph of the original you can see on the right there above the lever there's a screw hole and one below as well. In this original photograph, an early photograph of the mechanism, you can see that the screw is still there, the top screw that stops the lever going too high. So without making any holes in the machine, I've, um, I've added this little bracket which just acts as a stop. And I've done that with both machines. Here's the other one. So again, It just acts as a stop. You might have noticed that in the original machine the handle that turns the mechanism that moves the whole thing up and down inside, that's the disc mechanism, goes up and down. The handle's here. On the operator's side. Whereas Replicas have the handle here on the other side and I imagine that the reason for that is simply that had they put that handle here it might have interfered with the belt from the hidden modern motor drive that was in there which we're not going to be using again so, so it's not entirely authentic it still does the same job but uh, just another little difference there from the replicas compared to the original so I tidied up this aperture and also it now has the 100 watt lamp in there, so twice as bright. And there's a transformer for the computer fan, the cooling fan, that's on the back of the LED unit. When it's actually being used it does need something over that aperture where the, chim the missing chimney used to be. So I'll probably put something, make a plate of some kind, it can be dropped, dropped over there. In the meantime, I've got a cardboard cover over there, otherwise the light spills all around the room and rather destroys the effect. And that's the final version, I think, of the Silhouette Elephant Supraxiscope Replica Disc. Now let's see what it looks like on the screen. So we have the slot now. On the video it looks as though I've got the room lights on, I haven't. That's the automatic exposure bringing up as much exposure as it can. That might change when we start to project. Basically, um, again, there will be probably a black line arrangement interference, which is the video camera shutter. But um, Now some of that interference I'm actually seeing for real. I think you can see we've got a pretty good elephant there. And this is very much more like what the original audiences for my Bridges presentations would have seen on the screen, um, rather than the coloured, later coloured disc which he, he didn't show. So this is what people saw interspersed with photographic sequences of the elephant in motion so they saw the detail tonal contrast from the photographic sequences and then they saw the motion and i think you'll agree it would have been pretty difficult certainly pre-film animation for anyone an artist to simply draw that from the imagination and essentially that's captured the, the life of the animal. So it's informed by the camera, it's artwork informed by the camera. And um, we can make him go backwards. I don't think elephants are that great at walking backwards. And it's the first example of this machine really uh, of being able to see on the screen time flowing backwards, if you like. Resolution is not great, but I'm working from these medium format transparencies and as you can see the size of an individual elephant is tiny, just a few millimetres. So when that's scanned again and blown up on the screen uh, we are stretching things because obviously the original elephant was very much bigger than that. 
it's very tiny image each elephant so naturally blowing that up onto the screen there's there's a loss of focus that that wouldn't have been the case when my bridge showed his discs one way around that we could do will be to digitally scanning each elephant from the original disc individually and then making up a replica that way or a very very high resolution scan of the whole thing and despite the limitations of the retouched image my limitations uh, in Photoshop and the, and the limited resolution because we're working from the transparency rather than from the original. It, I think this gives a, a pretty good idea of how audience would have seen my bitches animals. So that's just a cardboard plate. Keep the light in. Now on this side of the lamp house, that's the far side of the lamp house. On the original, there is this holder that takes some kind of observation glass. I put a little piece of plywood in there. Um, but why is it able to slide in and out? And I suspect the reason for this is that one function would be, if you can imagine this as a frame with uh, tinted glass in the middle, one fun function would be to enable you to see what's going on with the lamp, either the arc lamp or the uh, oxyhydrogen limelight, which is very important and one of the assistants can keep an eye on that. But the other thing is that you can take that out and then you've got a fair bit of light coming out of here, which would illuminate your work. So if you needed some light coming from here, which you would to your box of discs down below, and then enable you to see sufficiently to be able to mount the disc on the machine. It would make sense, this, this would act as a little, basically, table lamp. Um, and then during the actual projection, you could put that back to stop too much light spilling out into the room. So I, I suspect, I can't think of any other reason why you would have the possibility of removing that very easily. Um, and I suspect that's its purpose. So um, it's possible we could make a little frame to replicate that, but in the meantime I've just put that in there. So I've just changed that back to the 50 watts unit. Let's see what happens. Well, it's still got the um, slight flicker shutter. You'll see that on the video as a black bar. But it doesn't have the secondary uh, problem. If you remember with the 100 watt lamp, we had these dark bars, about four dark bars per picture. And we were projecting the 13 pictures about 13 a second. So four times 13, 52. That's close to the mains frequency of 50. So we've clearly got a mains ripple there. So this is how it looked with both the shutter bar and the mains ripple. And this is how it looks now with the 50 watt lamp and we've just got the shutter bar, no mains ripple. So that's clearly an improvement. And you only see the shutter bar on the video, not in live presentation. So I think the lower light level unit will stay in there. Uh, 50 watts is bright enough. So it seems that the LED driver isn't smoothing out the 50 cycles sufficiently uh, when it provides the DC for the LED. Um, you sure that's what's happening? They are not the same make of driver um, and that's probably the problem. These things tend to be generic, you can't order a particular make. Um, from China, so a bit unlucky there with the 100 watt. It'll be fine for my slide lanterns, of course, where there's no shutter, but not for the moving picture projectors. So that's okay. We'll keep the 50 watt in there for Kingston, and that will give a much better result on the screen. 
without the secondary um, interference. 